Ingrid, so nice to see you. Thank you for coming out here to talk to me today. My pleasure. Thanks very much for doing this. We're going to try to be an antidote to our soundbite culture, and we, we have all the time in the world to go as deep and as long as you'd like to go. That sounds very good and very unusual. Yeah, well, <laughs> right. I mean, but I think much needed in, in, in this culture, right? We've lost our ability to have mature conversations with nuance. That's right. There's no depth to right. things anymore. Although I enjoyed you on, uh, on Bill Maher recently. That was fun. Oh, he's so kind. He, he really is. He's the first person I've ever heard, the only person I've ever heard say that his dogs are the only ones who greet him as if he's the Beatles when he comes home. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, he's, he, he's, he's one of those people that I think uh, he has a, a, an aversion to humankind in a certain way. He does, <laughs> you know? but he also lets people he disagrees with speak their piece. Of course. And then he argues honestly, which is something I very much respect about mm. with him because he hears the arguments out. So he, he's not sort of a Rush Limbaugh where he's very opinionated and he only has people who agree with him on his right, show. Right. He has the gamut. Yeah, he does. It's, and it's always fun when he's jousting with somebody that he doesn't agree with. But he's on board with everything that you've been doing for ages and ages. He's on our. He's he's a member of our board. He's our oh, he is. an honorary board member. Yes, and he has been. He was one of the very first, if not the first. Wow. So he has a big heart for animals. Yeah. Well, congratulations on the new book, Animal Kind. Thank you. It's a lovely read. I I, I found it to be. It wasn't what I was expecting. It's just kind of like this. Um, rumination on the beauty and complexity of animals of all species. If I can, I'll read the, which I have to read actually, I can't ever remember it, the subtitle, because that's integral to it, uh -huh. is Remarkable Dis Animal Kind, Remarkable Discoveries About Animals, and Revolutionary New Ways to Show Them Compassion. Because you're right, I did want to open people's eyes to who animals are and all their abilities, their talents, their emotions, the complex way they, ways they communicate, the, mm -hmm. just anything and everything. And you pick up so much information, it's hard to figure out what's not only interesting, but relevant to how we treat them. And the second part of the book is learning how to treat them perhaps better than we have been. Right, you've divided it into two parts. The first part is kind of this exploration of, of the unique talents of a variety of species. And rather than anthropomor anthropomorphize these animals, you really look at what makes them unique and special. And, and in, many, in so many ways, more talented, more intelligent than human beings. You know, the, the, the kind of underlying theme of the whole thing is historically, we've looked at the animal kingdom along this linear spectrum of intelligence and capability, right? And this really upends that by saying, the more we learn, the more we realize that um, it doesn't work that way, that almost every single animal has something about them that makes them not just more adapted to their environment, but um, but talented in ways and in capacities that humans lack. So there's an argument to be made that their intelligence exceeds that of our own in, in so many ways and in, and in countless ways, actually. Yeah, you're right. I mean, we have, and I go into this in the book, we've had really pathetic ways to determine animal intelligence because We've set the standard at human intelligence, which is one intelligence among many. Mm. And, you know, the animals, the other animals may not be able to make a nuclear warhead. That might be a really good thing. <laughs> they may not um, pollute the rivers with chemicals from leather tanneries. I, you know, hats off to them. Right. So that's what our intelligence has brought about. I mean, other things, too. We have anesthetics. We have all sorts of things because we're so creative. But I always think the average human being, take me, I couldn't make a cell phone. I couldn't make an aircraft. I just use those things. I use this technology. Mm -hmm. So even the average human can't be judged by what humankind has come up with. So the book, Animal Kind, is to say, look, we're all animals. It's a great orchestra of life, if you will. But human intelligence is not the gauge, because animals, as you say, they have extraordinary talents that far outdo from sense of smell, eyesight, a homing instinct, 
feeling seismic waves before an earthquake happens, for goodness sake, um, knowing that a tsunami is coming, elephants in Thailand trying to break the chains and run before anybody else knew it was happening. But all the ways that they have devised to deal with our world, because we have taken over their world, it's now our world, you know, it shouldn't be anthropomorphism either. As, mm -hmm. as you said, it's not as if humans are alone in having certain emotions like love and fear and loneliness and grief. All of that's a shared emotion. All those are shared emotions. So there is now, and I go into this in the book, this um, we've come from the great chain of being, which is where early, mostly Christians, or if maybe exclusively Christians, decided God was at the top, and then there were angels, then right. there were bishops, then there were kings and queens, for intelligence, all the way down to peasants, and under peasants, believe it or not, actors, <laughs> <laughs> which would make people very upset, yeah. and then under them, stones. I mean, under them, snakes and reptiles, uh -huh. uh, ugly the animals. The snake is kind of at the bottom, right, because yeah. of its place in the biblical canon. Exactly. Mm -hmm. And so it was all very religious, and that's how we um, graded animal life and animal intelligence. And from that, we have come to, there's this thing now called the mirror test, which scientists have used for some years to see how intelligent animals are, and that is, can they recognize themselves in a mirror? Now, tribal peoples have sometimes failed this test, I should point out, but they don't mention that, because a tribal person might see their mirror image and think it's someone attacking mm -hmm. them and attack the mirror. So chimpanzees, everybody says, oh, yes, of course, they pass it because they're primates like us. They're highly intelligent. We like chimpanzees. But this little fish called the wrasse, who's about the size of my finger, has also passed it. Uh -huh. She can recognize herself in the mirror and start preening, like Kim Kardashian <laughs> or somebody. Uh -huh. And then, um, luckily, she can't take selfies. But yeah, she's passed the test. So I think it's what we don't know. Right about animal intelligence. Right. Well, most people are familiar with the complexity of uh, you know, a dolphin's language or that of the whales, and, and we're aware of the migratory habits of many species of birds. But there's a lot of sort of new examples that I'd never heard of in this book that are pretty mind blowing. I mean, what are some of your favorite, you know, most kind of impressive? There are so things? many. And, you know, um, Rich, I collect information about animals, but in the research for this book, I learned a lot I, I didn't know. There is a moth who actually communicates with iridescence. And you have to be aligned, you probably have to be another moth, but you have to be aligned in such a way with their wings that you can see how the light catches them to know what they're communicating. Mm. And of course, cuttlefish, I did know this, can communicate with patterns of light and waves on one side of their body to say flirt with another cuttlefish mm -hmm. and not show that at all on the other side where they might be showing anger or being fierce against another cuttlefish that they want to stay away. Right. But we have tree frogs drum out their messages on bark, and we have actually city frogs now that use drain pipes to amplify their sound because human sounds in cities are now so um, loud. Right, you talk about that with birds and how they have to strain their voices now in order to get their calls heard and received. And get up earlier because our rush hour gets earlier and our rush hour is more din. And so the birds are getting up earlier so they can hear each other before humans take it over. Right, you even go so far as to talk about slime molds. <laughs> <laughs> you go all the way down to the single-celled animals. I think I put in slime molds because, uh, to me, it's startling that a slime mold can actually navigate a maze. And a slime mold has some way of, for lack of a better word, thinking about things, working things out, that makes us surely stop in our tracks and think, if a slime mold can figure something out, I'd better not shortchange the others. Because you said, you know, we know 
a lot about, say, how birds navigate by the stars, by low frequency uh, radio waves that we didn't right. even know existed at all. Sensing like the magnetism of the poles, yeah. things like this. Uh, the Earth's magnetic field, they, they are absorbing that, using it, using it to navigate and to think about things. But we don't actually act on that. We think, oh, that's interesting. And that's why the second part of animal kind was so important to me, because it says, hang on a minute, if you've learned all these phenomenal, jaw-dropping, awe-inspiring things about animals, then it's got to inform your behavior. You can't just go, that's interesting, and move on and <clears throat> continue to disrespect them or not give them credit or think of them as those, those mm -hmm. others, you know? Yeah, I think, it, and you make that point very plainly and clearly, um, but it's such a, a difficult um, sort of gap to, to, to bridge in the sense that it's, it's not necessarily about the information. The information is important, and the more that you can inform and educate people about the, <clears throat> you know, the nuances of intelligence and the emotional lives of these animals and the ability that they have to communicate and all of that. Um, but what is really required to move the needle in terms of people's behavior? You know, if it was just information, we would have solved this problem a long time ago. A good point, and obviously with the environment, if it was just information, we would have solved that a long time or ago. Any not, or pick your <clears throat> subject. Yeah, there yeah. has to be sometimes a threat or some almost cataclysmic occurrence that shakes us up. It usually takes some big thing that happens that makes you think, oh, this could impact me. Today, I do believe people have woken up, at least a lot of people have woken up to the environmental threat but they are trying to wangle their way around it. Like, do I really have to make these changes? How many changes do I have to make? So in Animal Kind, I point out that eating animals, for example, and it should be enough to just say, good God, I'm a civilized person. I think I'm a kind person. I'm not going to put money into the slaughterhouse or transportation of these animals. And all. But it's not enough, as you say. You need to think, well, what about my grandchildren then? Um, or what if I fly less? Or the new thing now is plastic straws. You know, great. Okay, right. don't use a plastic straw. But Fine. Let's, let's start with not eating uh, the fish. Uh, yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, like, and let's even look at... Like, I'm such a good person, I'm not using a plastic straw. That's great. While but, I'm eating my yeah, fish sandwich. Right, yeah. yeah, and you look at the trash in the ocean. Um, most of it isn't plastic straws, it's mostly discarded fishing gear. It's those big trawling nets, it's other things. Whales now we have off the coast of California even, who are being weighed down by crab traps. I mean, do you really have to eat a crab? Is it that important to you to eat a fish? <laughs> you know, just leave it be. And so couple that with your straw. So I do think you're right. People are, tr people need a jolt. And so I try to give them the amazing things about animals for their sympathy, for their empathy, for their understanding. But yes, at the end of the day, most people need to have a flood, an earthquake, at the end of the world. Right, it has to be personalized. Change. I mean, people are inherently, I believe, empathetic and live their lives you know, uh, in that manner. But I think the further, the greater distance there is between a decision that's made and the kind of, um, impact of that decision, the more difficult it is to change the behavior. So for example, with plastic straws, like wetting that to the environmental, you know, downstream impact of that is so distant from the choice of whether you're gonna put a straw in your cup at Starbucks that it's hard to, you know, it's hard to get people to change. I think the food that is on our plate is a little bit more direct because you see the animal product and you can understand that something had to be killed for that, but still you're not the person doing the slaughtering, right? Or if you're wearing a leather belt or whatever it is, um, it's easy to sort of remain myopic to that. But the closer, I think education is, you know, goes a long way towards wetting those things together so that people can do their own inherent math and realize 
the downstream impact of the choices that we're, we're making. But, um, but it's tricky. I mean, you spent your whole life, you know, on this, on this issue. And I got to say on some level, you've got to, it's got to be incredibly gratifying to see how far this movement has come since you got into this in the 1970s. Yeah, I, we weren't an overnight success, I can yeah. tell you that. You know, all social movements, and that's something that actually gives me hope, is um, I not only look at how society has changed. I mean, when we were starting 1980, we were pioneers, believe mm. it or not. Things like soy powder, you had to buy in a co-op if you could find it, mix it with water by hand or with a whisk. And now you go to the supermarket and you stare for 10 minutes thinking, do I want the macadamia or the, right. you know, it's just yeah, yeah, ridiculous. Yeah. Um, so yes, how far we've come. But all social movements go through the same thing, you know, ridicule, discussion, acceptance. And I think we've come quite a long way. But yeah, uh, I, I'm not necessarily gratified it so much as I try to be optimistic because I can only be hopeful looking back mm -hmm. at how far we've come. And people who are in their 20s today, I mean, this is like the feminist movement. You have no idea with women's rights how far we have come. With everything, civil rights, how far we have come much, much further to go. Right, so the foot's not coming off the gas. Not at all, not you. no. You can pry my dead <laughs> fingers from people yeah, for the okay. ethical treatment of animals. <laughs> well, let's take it back. I mean, you were born in England, but you were really raised in New Delhi, right? Is that where you spent your formative years? Well, India, um, my parents were in New Delhi and I was shunted away to Hill Station boarding schools because it's too hot in Delhi in the summer. And so, yes, I was raised by... Uh, nuns in the in the hills, uh -huh. which is why I'm <laughs> right. pretty much allergic to nuns today. <laughs> I, can, I can only imagine. Um, <laughs> but your mom worked with Mother Teresa. She did. And when I went home for the holidays, there was an orphanage in New Delhi. There was one in Calcutta. And we used to pack um, pills for lepers. We used to stuff uh, toys for the kids. We used to go over and play with them and all that kind of stuff. Wow. But she also took in animals. She always said to me, it doesn't matter who suffers, but that they suffer. And if there's something you can do about it, shake a leg. Well, your real interest in, in, in animal suffering and animal rights wouldn't come until much later, but obviously that, that's a powerful seed that was planted early. I always, you know how some people are drawn to art? I don't understand art at all, but I always was drawn to animals. Mm -hmm. And so it it wasn't later. It was at that time in childhood. I was the one saying, oh, mommy, look, there's somebody beating a, a bull by the side of the road. Or, oh, look, there's a dog in that drainage ditch. And I always had that. Mm. Did you have personal interactions with Mother Teresa? I didn't. I never met her. Oh, you didn't? No, never met her at all. My mother did, but I didn't. Yeah. She, she worked mm. with her directly at times? Yes. And there were lots of volunteers, mostly expatriates who were over um, with free time and were able to help with charities in India. So my mother was big on unwed mothers. She looked after uh, that because they were ostracized, cast out in society. And uh, children, she always loved children. Um, and animals too, but yeah, lepers, right. the, the lot. So you take your <laughs> your fine uh, Catholic uh, private school <laughs> upbringing and somehow find your way to Maryland at some point. I did. Um, it was a circuitous route, but I actually married somebody in, um, in Europe who was American, and we came back to the U.S. to live. And I was studying for the brokerage. I was going to be a stockbroker. Yeah, <laughs> there's something very comical about that. Well, I've, it, it's even stupider because I've always loved math. And I thought I wanted to be a pure mathematician. But I also wanted to travel a lot in my youth. And so I thought, well, what's numbers? Oh, all right, I'll become a stockbroker. Mm -hmm. So I was busy doing that when somebody moved away next door to me and left all these kittens behind. I don't know, two dozen or something. And I thought, oh. Just moved out and left Just them. moved out. And I thought, oh, I need to take them to somewhere that looks after them. Looked up in the phone book. We didn't have Google then. Found the nearest animal shelter, put them in my VW bus, 
drove them to the shelter, and it, I was just astounded. This was the United States of America. It was filthy. It was harsh. Um, they put the kittens down immediately when they took them into the back room. I was stunned, went into the kennel, and they were yelling at the dogs who were confused. And all those childhood feelings of caring about animals came rushing back to me. And I thought, I'm not a stockbroker. I, I, I need to care about animals. And I applied for a job in the kennel. It was, it was really that crystal clear, that moment. Oh, it was. It like was. A- I hate injustice. And there's nothing that gets me more upset than people bullying. And they were bullying those animals in that place. And I thought, I, I have to work here. Mm. And how long did you work there? Well, I worked there and I blew the whistle on them. So I was chucked out. I wow. went out on my ear. I went to the council and I worked hard and got the people in charge of that shelter thrown out. Is that how you got mm-hmm. into law enforcement then? It is. Yeah. I then became a cruelty investigations <laughs> uh-huh. officer and started, I then went to a sheriff's rookie school for the police department to learn right. how to prosecute cases. And um, that's what I did. What was the state of that department at the time? Of the cruelty investigations? Yeah, I mean, what was, go- I mean, just, I'm trying to get a sense of, of kind of what the perspective was in terms of enforcing anything, you know, against this kind of behavior. It was pretty pathetic. It still is in some jurisdictions, and we still have to fight hard at PETA to get prosecutors to take some cases seriously. But back then, it was almost non-existent. I read the law in the state of Maryland. All these laws are written for lay people to understand. They're not complicated. And you have to divide them by the elements. And I thought, we need to use this. So I went and met with the state's attorney, and I made my case. I got deputized. I had a law enforcement background then because I decided I needed to be trained, and I began to bring prosecutions. And the judges I found in most cases were completely sympathetic. Many of them had a dog or a horse or something, and they didn't like what they were hearing. And so they cracked down on the people who were starving or beating or whatever they were doing to animals. Right, wow. Um, so when does, when, how is PETA born out of this? Well, from there, um, I was asked to go and clean up what was then the DC dog pound, the Washington DC dog pound. And I had some friends who were in government who advocated for me, and I became the first lay pound master, <laughs> which I thought was a really butch title. I liked it very much. Um, And I went and took over the D.C., what is now Animal Shelter, and put in place the first spay and neuter clinic that um, there was, and uh, made sure that no longer could universities come waltzing into our place and take their pick of the animals and use them in experiments, which is what was going on. And no longer could dog fighters and people who wanted a guard dog just come in, plonk $5 on the table, and take out some big, aggressive dog. So I tried to change all that and pretty much did. Made it into a fine place, had wonderful help, and um, bequeathed it to the Washington Humane Society to run. Uh And then um, while I was doing that, formed People for the Ethical Treatment of Animals because... I read Peter Singer's book, Animal Liberation, and thought, oh, good grief. You shouldn't just be being kind to animals within the context of using them. They're other nations. They're just like us. We are animals. We need to stop seeing them as hamburgers and handbags and tools for research. We need to see them as other individuals and treat them with respect. Leave them in peace. So it changed my whole perspective. Yeah, that book has had such a profound impact on so many people and, and culture at large. It's still as relevant today as it, as it ever was. Oh, it's a terrific book because he takes you back to the anti-slavery movement, for example, and said, you know, some people said, well, uh, we'll always have slaves because uh, they're stoic, they don't cry out in pain, you can do all these things to them, they're not as intelligent. And as um, Congressman Dellum said once on Capitol Hill, when they were hearing a bill about animals, he said, if you took the word slave out of an old 
a congressional appeal, a hearing, and put in the word animal, or you did the same here, put in slave, you would have the same arguments being made by those who wish to continue to exploit whomever they wish to exploit. Mm -hmm. So you can, I mean, I didn't grow up with the same kind of prejudice. I grew up with the Raj, with British people thinking that they were so superior to Indians. My father would clap his hands and somebody would come running to see what he wanted. You know, we people look down on, on Indians. Indian immigrants to the United Kingdom were treated very, very badly. Uh, I grew up with that. I formed the first Beatles fan club in school in India, and it was a convent. And Mother Superior came into our hall where we were all gathered and said, stand, Ingrid Ward, that was my name then. She said, I understand that you have started a fan club for the Beatles. Do you know that they come from a slum? <laughs> and that was it, working that class was it. people. And the I, worst thing you could say. You know, working class mm. people were denigrated as if they were stupid, know-nothings. And mm -hmm. so I translate this to animal rights and think, you know not of what you speak, and hence animal kind, this is who they are. You are not a god as a human being, and they are not trash. You know, they are feeling emotional, complex intelligences, and yet you have them in chains, in cages, <coughs> you're hitting them with a bullhook or a whip, you're throwing things down their throats to test your medicines and cosmetics, hands off just the same way we now understand with certain other human beings. Yeah. At this time, other than Peter Singer's book, there, I mean, there was no animal rights movement, so to speak. There was nothing. I think not even the word vegan. You know, vegan was a person from Las Vegas or from the planet, some Vegas or something. Um, no, animal rights wasn't even a concept until Peter Singer put it into a, the vernacular. And not even the vernacular, I mean, it was just floating about. And we had the first animal rights conference, because before that, there used to be health vegetarian conferences. Uh -huh. That was it. It was all about laxatives and living longer. And so we had the first animal rights conference. And we talked then about, can we show you what you're not being shown by advertisers it's not a happy little pig in an apron dancing his way to your sandwich or barbecue. You know, this is what they're doing. They're notching their ears. They're cutting off their tails. They're castrating them. No painkiller. And people were stunned. We said, look, we've been inside a laboratory. We went inside that Silver Spring. Right, right. I want one. to talk about that. And this is what we found. It's not a few animals being treated well because they may hold the cure to saving a baby. You know, it's just wanton abuse, neglect, disregard for them. And nobody is looking at better ways. If you just want to be uh, more efficient, forget the animals for a minute. People aren't putting the money into where we could be more efficient for our own selfish sakes. So we changed the conversation and we uttered the word vegan and we uttered the words right. animal rights in that first conference. People must have thought you were bananas <clears throat> back then though. Oh yeah, uh, many people did and we were mocked. We had a demonstration in Washington against a chicken slaughterhouse and it made, because it was so weird that anyone would care about a chicken, in 1980, it made the front page of the Washington Post. It was on every radio station. I worked uh -huh. for the government at the time, and I remember being listening to the radio, and no matter what station you tuned in, it was, there are people protesting chicken slaughter. <laughs> like, what the hell are these people doing? Is that when you realized the power of the media? I mean, you've, you're no stranger to knowing how to grab headlines. Back I mean, then, you're a master provocateur. Well, we have to be. I mean, you know, it's just, you want to reach the most people that you can. Mm -hmm. And obviously leafleting on the street, one pamphlet at a time, we still do. And it's what you, could, back then it was what you could do. There was no internet, uh -huh. you know, but we did learn. And back then, as you mentioned earlier, People were more willing to discuss things in depth. 
so we could make the case of who animals are and why we need to look for other ways instead of just abusing them, making them suffer. You, th you think that it's harder to do that now? Oh, it's much harder. Today it's sex, it's conflict, it's politics, of course. I mean, who can avoid that right now? Yeah. Well, you're the crazy chicken lady in 1980, but Peter really you know, got on the map by virtue of this Silver Spring monkey case, right? So walk us through that because that was really, that really set in motion a lot of change. It did, and that again made the front page of the Washington Post. It also made 60 Minutes in Australia. It made the whole run of press that there was to be had. I think why it struck a nerve is that most people had been sold a bill of goods and they did believe that, oh, it's not so many animals and they must be treated okay. That researchers had perpetuated, made sure that they said, we're scientists, don't question us. And in fact, they would say that quite openly. Who are you to question us? We're scientists. Mm -hmm. They were above the law. And we were able to show by going into this one laboratory and showing videos, actually it was film at that point, and um, photographs, mostly photographs, and getting expert opinions of the hideous condition that these 17 monkeys were kept in tiny cages, rusted wires, breaking their fingers off because their backs had been operated on and they didn't have that much nerve sensation in their arms, being just left in these tiny boxes in a room, being given electric shocks in a converted refrigerator, having their testicles squeezed with pliers to see if they felt, mm -hmm. all these things. We were able to bring it out into the light of public opinion, put it on the news, go in with a search warrant, bring the animals out. And for the first time, people thought, good God, I've been able to see inside. It's not like we've been told at all. Right. And we got bags of mail, sacks of mail from all over the country saying, how can I help? Which are truly the most magic words, the words was, I love to hear today. <laughs> was that the first time that anybody had sort of covertly photographed what goes on kind of behind closed doors with animals? No, um, before that, there had been two other situations in New York where um, somebody had leaked films, uh, leaked photographs of monkeys being used in space exploration tests, pre-space exploration tests. And the other at the New York uh, Museum of Natural History. And they were both very awful, but they hadn't circulated because nobody had really been able to do anything. There had been a protest outside the History Museum. But with this, we had primatologists, anthropologists, veterinarians from all over who we took into the lab at night and showed them the conditions, showed them the monkeys with festering wounds, showed them everything, and they filled out expert statements. And with those expert statements and the photographic, photographic evidence, we were able to get a search warrant. That was the first time, mm. and that made it all break open. Mm. So images ended up on the front page of the Washington Post, I guess. <laughs> Several times. Media, yeah, and it becomes like a huge deal, right? Supreme Court case, and ultimately, uh, culminates in the passing of the Animal Welfare Act in 1985, right? The amendments to it. Uh -huh. um, there was already, thanks to the Animal Welfare Institute, the, there had been 1996 or 1976, I can't remember now, there was the animal, no, it must be 17, 1976, there was an Animal Welfare Act. Nobody was enforcing it, which the Silver Spring Monkeys case made crystal clear. And there was no interrelationship between the people who gave the money, say the National Institutes of Health, the biggest funder of animal experiments in the world, and the so-called inspecting body, the United States Department of Agriculture, where the inspector came maybe once every year, two years, sat in the front office, had a cup of coffee, asked the experimenter if everything was okay, and left without even looking at the animals. So right. these things really... Uh, were made possible to understand through the Silver Spring Monkeys case. And what was the specific issue that was before the high court? Well, what had happened was the lower court had um, found the experimenter guilty, a, a jury trial, on several counts. He then appealed, 
And we went to the Supreme Court, and the Supreme Court sent it back. Custody of the animals was mm -hmm. actually the issue. Sent it back to the lower court to rule. Mm -hmm. So this thrusts you into the limelight in a, in a pretty big way. It did. Um, we were amateurs. We didn't know what we were doing really, except I mean, we how many how people were, did, were working at PETA at the time? <laughs> well, there were five of us as uh -huh. the core, and there might have been a few dozen who had come out. I remember Reagan was elected, and there was a big parade in Washington. And we went out with a banner. It was all very patriotic looking, stars and stripes and red, white, and blue. And it was that old Frank Sinatra song, Take Back Your Mink, Take Back Your Pearls. And we had changed the lyrics. And people had seen that on national television because the parade was being uh, televised. And one of the people, uh, the main announcers, had actually sung it, thinking it was a, just a patriotic song, wow. realizing it was the first ever animal rights song. And all these people started to get in touch with us to say, yeah, I don't wear fur. I don't want to wear fur. And yes, I don't want to exploit animals. How can I help? Mm. So all together, yes. And where... At what point, like, do you do you make this conscious decision about the strategy that you're going to deploy? Like, you're nothing if not like controversial for a lot of these kind of, um, you know, various forms of protests over the years that grab headlines, but also really ruffle ruffle a lot of feathers <laughs> too and make people angry. Well, we always say, you know, we're not here necessarily to make friends. We'd like to. Yeah. But well, we're, we're still talking about <laughs> these things, yeah, right? And that's in no small part due to the, you know, the edgy nature of how you staged these events. We like to make sure it's conversational. So people might put us down. And in the old days, certainly that was par for the course, is people would say, have you seen what those Peter people are doing? But they'd say it at a dinner conversation, and then everyone would talk about it. And I think people would say, well, yeah, I mean, they're crazy, but... And then they'd talk about the issue. You know, I don't like what's happening to animals for fur, for mm -hmm. example, or, or so on. We try to be provocative because... I mean, what's the point? Someone on our staff said it's like a car crash. If Peter is doing it, you have to look, even if you don't want to. <laughs> right. um, All the way up through, you know, every. It seems like every year. I don't know if you did it this year, but you'll you'll tape some uh, some public service announcement type television commercial with the intention of of you know saying this is our Super Bowl commercial, and then creating additional press out of the fact that it gets rejected because no network's ever going to air <laughs> these I know. things that you create. <laughs> <laughs> We'd be delighted if yeah. they ever did air one of our commercials on the uh -huh. Super Bowl. And we do have a couple of donors who said, if they ever do, we will we'll, we'll give you the money. But no, they don't air it. And we go in knowing they probably aren't going to. This year, we did a fabulous one. It's oh, still online. I didn't see online. this year's. Oh, okay. Oh, it's so what good. What is it? It's, I, I don't know if I can convey this. You have to look at it. It's on peter.org. It's a bee who is humming the national anthem and floating. It's all animated, floating around and visits or flies over all these other animals. There's a bear, a deer, a fox, a fish um, who take a knee. Oh, I did see this. Yes, and I did see it, this. Uh, it makes me yeah. cry every time yeah. I see it. I have to tell you, I'm a sentimentalist, but um, I think it's just beautiful. And at the end, it says, you know, every living being deserves respect. And of course, Lisa Lange, who is in our office, is the creative person yeah. behind She's this. She's sitting right over there. Former and, podcast guest, too. Hi, Lisa. She went to um, an agency. They crafted it so beautifully. It's perfect. Um and we then, Lisa went to Colin Kaepernick and said, uh, is this all right with you, the concept? And he said, yes. And so, because we didn't wish to be disrespectful in any way, we wished to show, he's a vegan, mm -hmm. that we're all in this together. That respect should be for everyone. Doesn't really matter who you identify with. Like, it's not just for me as a woman, women's rights. There's a principle. Right. It's not just you because you're whatever you are, uh, race, religion, age, it's because there's a principle. Discrimination is wrong. Bullying is wrong. Respect is everything. Uh, looking out for the other guy. And he said, great. Right. So we, we put it up. NFL stepped in, apparently. They went to Fox. I mean, you know, they don't like anything to mm -hmm. do with it. And uh, so Anything it that involves taking a knee. 
Oh, no knees. <laughs> no knees will be taken. Yeah. <laughs> Which is a sad thing in yeah. so many ways. But f- over 4 million people have watched it right away. And uh, it's still going strong on the internet. Yeah. And, and, and as provocative as anything you've ever done, I would think, you know, in a different way, in a, in a more kind of like subtle way, I suppose. And my sense is that like looking at the movement and the evolution of the movement from 10,000 feet, there was a moment in time where in order to get people's attention, you would have to do these crazy things just to get people to even consider the issue, you know, that that that's beneath that. But the movement has matured to such a point where there is adequate mainstream awareness about what's going on, at least on some level. And and as such, the tactics have to evolve as well. Like it's it's not necessary to kind of do some of those things you were doing in the 80s and 90s anymore. In fact, it might be counterproductive. There's a more um, uh, you know, kind of a different tactic that you can take now in order to provoke the discussion. I think what people don't know about Peter is that we have an enormous corporate uh, negotiations arm. We're behind the scenes, and we always have been, but it gets bigger, behind the scenes talking to retailers and others who use animals in exploitive ways, cause them a lot of pain and suffering. But Actually, while we no longer have to crawl with our hands and legs in steel traps, for example, outside stores, although Canada Goose uh, is certainly still catching coyotes in steel traps and stuffing geese into slaughter crates, um, fur is dead. It really is. That was our slogan. It's happened. None of the big houses, Gucci, Galliano, Donna Versace, none of them have fur anymore. However, that said... And we are not mainstream in other ways because we have become mainstream, which we have to be careful about, with fur, uh, with eating animals. But we still have things to do because we've been in every sheep shearing shed, try to say that quickly, in on every continent except Antarctica. And in every single shed, we have found things that would turn people's stomachs about the way wool is taken from the sheep. I mean, sheep being bashed in the face, being Mm -hmm. I've seen those videos. It's horrible. And more people should. Leather, you know, I've been back to India, followed the cattle trail. People are amazed that India exports so much leather. They're a major leather exporter. Leather isn't environmentally friendly. It's full of, you know, decomposition, toxins, and what have you. But the cruelty to the cows is extreme. So we still- So ironic. (laughs) Beyond Given ironic. That it's India. Well, you look at also, you know, the cow is sacred, mother cow. Nandi the bull is sacred, and he's pulling these overloaded sugarcane carts. Uh, you have Ganesh, the elephant, who is sacred, who is in chains for life in a temple, going blind in, with trumpets in his ears and wedding parades. It's like anything, you know. Christians say, uh, don't cheat on your wife. <laughs> they say don't steal, but yes, that's fine. Uh, people do. Um, but no, we now have demonstrations outside fashion shows where our people are taking this odd mixture. It's charcoal and syrup, I think. It makes some grungy mess, pouring it, black muck, pouring it on their heads and faces and appearing in photographs around the world to say, please, it, leather is cruel. It's environmentally unsound. Get away from that too. It's just carcass. It's the bigger profit part of slaughtering a cow. If you're vegetarian, you're supporting mm-hmm. the meat industry by buying it. Yeah, and there is so much innovation happening right now in terms of new textiles. You know, it's interesting to kind of you know watch that evolve. I feel like the food space is a little bit further down the line. Uh, in, in comparison to what's going on in apparel and, and garments, um, but it's changing quickly. Oh, it's phenomenal. And in Animal Kind, I talk about that as one of the things that you can do is you just sometimes don't realize it. But if you look, we now have, if you want to look chic or trendy or my God, or if you want to be warmer than if you were wearing polar, real fleece or fur, We have apple leather, grapefruit leather, pineapple leather, you name it. I just saw out of Mexico this coming cactus leather. Mm. I mean, phenomenal things. Nike has a range of shoes now made of ash, 
And I think Nike or Reebok has a range of sports shoes made of trash. I know. I just saw that <clears throat> Nike's releasing this new shoe that's complete, made out of completely recycled garbage. And recycled yeah. fishing nets. So yeah, back to yeah. if you want to save the oceans, you know, you can save the oceans, save the cows, save the planet all in one, one go. With fashion, how does it go? Like if you're going to approach... Michael Kors or Ralph Lauren or any of these, you know, big houses and you're having this backdoor kind of negotiation with them, what does that look like? It's actually pretty simple is that we ask for a meeting and we start at the top and we see who we get. And often we will get the buyers and we will get the decision makers and we will show them. We will go to Milan or wherever it is. Um, and some of them, like Zara, for example, has flown us over to uh, their neck of the woods, and we will show them the videos. And we'll say, this is exactly what this material comes from. It's not a material, it's not a natural fiber, it's, it's from the animal. It's stolen from them, they're killed for it, they're abused, their suffering is atrocious. Um, it's not sustainable, that's one of the buzzwords now, the humane washing words, or the environmental washing words. Um, it's not sustainable. Cruelty shouldn't be sustainable. It's, it's cruel or it's not. We've got Patagonia. We've got all these areas in Argentina where the sheep are decimating the land and the people's income should not be dependent on that. You can have other things. You know, we didn't have to continue to grow tobacco to sustain people's mm -hmm. livelihoods. So we go and we sit down and we show them and then we show them the alternatives. And we show them, here's a faux, whatever it is, fleece, wool, leather. Here's a range of them. And these are the you companies. You actually bring in the samples. We absolutely do. We like mm -hmm. carpet salesmen. We have a portfolio, and it's got all these samples. And we say, here are the contact names and addresses. And for these companies, please get in touch with them. And there actually is a new um, company now that has just started up that is trying to, and I forget the name, um, but it's, it's on the website, but it started up trying to get investor money to help these companies just mm. the way impossible and Berg, Berg beyond and all these other companies. Oh, you, good food me. Institute, you mean Bru it, what Bruce Friedrich's doing? It's a good food Institute for, for clothing. Oh, for clothing. Exactly. Yeah, that's and a that's great, what's that's needed. That's a great idea. Yeah. And we're yeah. helping fund it at the moment, but it needs to have investor capital. Uh huh. And what is the general level of receptivity? I, I would imagine Good. it varies. Really? It, it does vary. I mean, there are some old holdouts, but they've seen now what's happened with fur. You know, there were people who said, we will always use fur. And they've, they don't anymore. I, they had to go with the times. You look at Anna Wintour at Vogue, who was never seen on the hottest summer day without a full-length <laughs> fur. Yeah. And uh, we actually complained to the IRS that she needed to declare all these mm. free fur she was getting. But just last week, a week before, she was in a Stella McCartney faux fur. Uh, it's just phenomenal. They know now that times are changing, consumer interests are changing, the next generations up don't like cruelty to animals. They don't like the fact that if you throw a fur coat out the window or even a pair of leather shoes out the window, you can come back in a decade. They're still there because they have been treated with mortants, yeah. anti-decomposition chemicals. So I'm still I'm still <laughs> stuck on Anna Wintour. I'm imagining her in her <laughs> office in like 1994, like swearing about the thorn in her side that is Ingrid Newkirk. <laughs> she was actually because you know <laughs> yeah. we invaded her office. Yes, I know. <laughs> we went up the elevator, uh -huh. took over her office. She locked herself in her office. We had begged her. We had written to her. We had shown her everything. Heart of of absolute ice. And I sat at the reception in Vogue and answered the phone. And every single call that came in, they would ask for something. And I'd say, I'm awfully sorry. Vogue is closed today due to cruelty to animals. And hang, Where hang was up. the receptionist? You oh, just they commandeered fled. the... Uh, oh, they they fl <laughs> everybody fled. <laughs> so what happened? She had to eventually come out of her office. Eventually, the police came and took us out of the oh, office. Man. And uh, it got great news. And people heard our story <laughs> about what happens to animals in traps and fur farms. Have you had interactions with her since? Um, yes, but they haven't exactly been uh, pleasant. One of our members 
some years back threw a dead raccoon into her soup plate when she was dining at the Four Seasons Hotel. Um, and that was in the news. After that, probably, I actually— Probably not the best way to <clears throat> win her heart and mind. But, you know, we had tried everything. Honest God, it wasn't us. It was a member. But people were angry with her because she had seen all the footage. She, she couldn't miss it. And French Vogue had decided they never— French Vogue, of all places, had decided it would never show fur. And yet Anna Wintour's Vogue carried on just really pimping fur in almost every page. So— then she had a birthday, I think, and I actually suggested, because there had been new research that showed if you are oblivious to suffering, that perhaps it's not your fault, that your mirror neurons might not be well developed, that your seat of empathy oh, no. might not. And I offered to give her a free oh, brain scan so we could stop oh, my God. <laughs> sending her letters, begging her not to wear fur. She did not reply. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my God. Um, well, you said we were provocative. No, you I know. Absolutely Listen, right. you, yeah, 100%, 110%. <laughs> uh, I, I, it seems to me that like when you look at the food space, the way to win the war is to create um, plant-based analogs to people's favorite meat and dairy products, make them cost-effective and taste just as good, if not better. And I think that applies as well in the fashion context. Like you need the Stella McCartney who can create something beautiful and magical mm -hmm. that isn't using these materials to kind of lead the way. Right? Oh, absolutely. And once you do that, if you can meet Anna Wintour's standards, like then, then all the rest of the chips fall in line. I agree. Um, with meat and dairy, we, we call them taste-alikes because you don't really have to make an ethical decision. You can just have watched the taste that you've perhaps grown up with or your tongue has been become accustomed to without any effort. It's all there. It's in the store. It doesn't cost more to, to switch over to it. Um, the same is true with clothing. And what we're finding, of course, is big companies now know that they've got better sports gear if they go away from the old animal. I mean, can you imagine someone climbing Everest now in a big fur coat? You know, so we, those things, polyfill and all these things are available to, and, and that is changing the market. But yes, there always have to be pioneers. It's like Joaquin Phoenix standing up at the Oscars right. and saying- I mean, that was a, that was a, a watershed moment. Absolutely. He'd already veganized what the Golden Globes and the other right. uh, award ceremonies up until that point. And then he stood there and he decided to talk about mother love. He decided to talk about the love a mother cow has for her child and how thoughtless it is to just want a real cheese pizza topping. And I just thought, I love you with all my heart. You wonderful man. He was a very courageous, bold, and, and beautifully honest and heartfelt speech that he gave. Honest. It was yeah. honest. And we are grown-ups, aren't we? I mean, that's what I say in the book, is it's time to come to grips with who we are. We tell our children that we're kind, we're decent, that you know we live by principles. We don't like oppression, domination, bullying, injustice. Well, do we? Because you can't pretend that animals are tables and chairs. They're not. They're animate. You know, anima from life is that they feel. And how awful if we don't behave like adults and take personal responsibility. Mm. I was really moved <laughs> that Joaquin, after the SAG Awards, left the ceremony and in his tuxedo went straight to the pig vigil. Oh, it was And wonderful. I know he does it all the time. He was there last night as well. He's a true activist. Yeah. And I mean, you can be an activist as I talk about an animal kind, you can be an activist just by deciding, well, I eat three times a day at least, <laughs> and I'll make sure that that doesn't contribute. Or what I wear, I shampoo my hair. Whatever you do in the normal course of your day. But Joaquin is an activist activist. He's like James Cromwell, like a bunch of people. Pamela Anderson, wherever she goes in the world, she calls us and she says, what's happening in Lithuania or wherever she is? Uh, for animals. And we tell her, and she makes sure to do an action for animals in addition to mm. whatever else she's doing. 
There are only so many people and they have such a command of people's attention that each one is gold dust, each one is precious, and he, his heart breaks for animals. Yeah, it's, it's, it's for real with him totally. all the way through. When you look at the current state of affairs, I'm interested in how you choose your battles, right? Like if you, if we want to identify like the biggest culprits, the biggest problems, I mean, factory farming seems to be number one to me. And it's also, uh, you're shaking your head, maybe you disagree, but let me just finish this thought. In that also, it's, it's, it's a situation in which there's massive popular support. Like nobody's sitting around going, yay for factory farming. Like even ardent meat eaters don't like that idea. And it just seems ripe to be reformed, if not completely overturned. And innovation is working towards that. But I'm interested um, in where you kind of come down with the work that PETA is doing to combat the, you know, the tragic ills and suffering that that system creates. There's no question animal-based agriculture has had its day. It needs to go. The only people defending it really are two camps. The people who uh, do it for a living, uh, the, the farmers, the factory farmers themselves, and their trade groups who will defend it. Um, in fact, a farmer was addressing a conference a few years ago and said, if Ingrid Newkirk were a cow, I'd have her on the truck right now, which I thought, that's so nice. I hope you're single. <laughs> anyway, um, yes, Are got that. <laughs> Are you on Tinder? Are you on Tinder? Yes. <laughs> so, yeah, there's that. But there's also, I was just at the um, Jimmy Carter Library in Atlanta, and one of the filmmakers for C-SPAN said to me, I really don't like cruelty to animals, but, you know, I'm never going to give up eating meat. And so I said to him, well, then you can't eat anything from a supermarket. You know, you can't eat anything where somebody didn't, didn't walk up to that cow or pig or chicken, shoot them in the head when they weren't looking, and none of the other animals were either. You cannot do it. And he was so desperate to cling to this old mm. habit that that's another group that we have to deal with. But the way we figure out what to do, I think, is we're opportunists because we have to see which way the wind is blowing and then help push it in the right direction. So we give away food. We were down when KFC did the um, finger licking vegan chicken giveaway in Atlanta. Mm -hmm. Um, and we've been working behind the scenes with them, and that will be coming. We give out food, especially soy milk, almond milk, and so on, to kids who are lactose intolerant. Show them, you know, there's something else you can eat. But we look at where the largest animals suffer the most, and definitely that's in food production. Don't have to eat animals, please. But the second, I think, is experimentation, because... There may be fewer animals, and that's not saying few, it's fewer, but they suffer sometimes for 40 years in a cage, in a room, staring at the wall with no life whatsoever, someone taking biopsies, sticking things in their heads, taking their kids away, uh, all that, that the, the length of time is huge. And clothing, because as I say, every animal used for clothing is eaten, I can't mm -hmm. think of an exception. Even ostriches used for feathers, they go into ostrich medallions at the specialty exotic um, restaurant. Crocodiles are eaten. You know, all these animals are eaten. So it's part and parcel of its one profit base. Right. But we also do look at exotic cruelties like foie gras, where you can say to people, it's like fur. You don't need it. Why on earth, of all the things you cling to, would you decide, I've got to have a stuffed goose's liver <laughs> for Christmas, you know? That's got to be going the way of fur, though. Except in France yeah. and Austria and yeah. a couple of other places. But with Brexit, uh, you might be able to stop it from being imported into the UK, for example. And that's mm. another nail in the coffin of that. I feel f pretty much briefed on everything that's kind of going on with factory farming. Uh, but the animal testing world is something I know very little about. So maybe illuminate the realities that are going on here. It's the same thing with taste-alikes, really, is that you've got to move people away from what they're used to. 
And as with factory farmers, that's what they're doing and they don't want to change. You have animal experimenters who have gone into the business early. They've been doing the same thing for donkey's years. No one has ever tapped them on the shoulder and said, excuse me, you're not finding out anything, but these animals are suffering and you're killing them. And so they carry on doing it. We have a system with almost no enforcement in it at all. And I'll give you one example. We have a thing called the forced swim test. This is so absurd and so cruel. They take small animals, drop them into a beaker of water with solid sides, and the animals, of course, are panicked. They are going to drown. They dive to the bottom looking for a way out. They try to scramble up the sides and they can't get out. And the whole purpose... This is used by universities as show and tell. It's used by pharmaceutical companies. It's to just document how many minutes it takes them to give up, to stop swimming. And then you just record this. This is typical. And we are knocking that test For out. Purpose, what is the purpose <clears throat> of that? Originally, it was some cockamamie, crude way to decide when an animal gets depressed, too depressed to carry on, in the development of depre antidepressant, antidepressants. Oh, wow. Uh, it still goes mm. on. And what we find is the electric shock plate test in universities with hanging animals by their tails just to see how long they stop struggling. We have maternal deprivation experiments by psychologists, millions upon millions of dollars being spent all over the country with people in basement labs who are taking monkeys' babies away and then frightening them with plastic snakes, with plastic spiders, with men in masks, and just recording their reaction. This goes on. One experiment will go on for 40 years, and nobody says, maybe you shouldn't be doing this anymore. We have organs on a chip, human lungs, a heart on a chip. We have whole slivers of human brain you can grow in a Petri dish. We have human DNA on the internet. We have high-speed computers you can program now with human data. You know, what are we doing? Still taking these animals away from each other, keeping them unnaturally in total misery, and visiting all these horrors on them. What is the state of the law? Like, what does the law say when it law comes to this Law hasn't been changed for, forever. Um, most animal experiments are exempt from state law. That happened a long time ago, and nobody really wants to change it. There are big trade groups that fight. They won't even expand the size of a cage. We've been up on Capitol Hill year after year. I, I give up on legislation. I think it's, as with most things, it's education. And the new generations coming up, we have a film out now called Research Subjects. It's three women, happen to be women, who were bullied into using hundreds of animals in order to get their PhDs. And each one of them at the time thought, wait a minute, this isn't helping anyone. This isn't advancing my medical knowledge. This is just the way it's been. And the, each one of them, not knowing of the others, try to argue with their professors. And their professors said, no, 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 you can't have your PhD unless you do this. this. You have to do it. They now all regret it. And other PhD candidates are coming forward to say, that's what we've been told too. It's the way it is in research labs. But times have moved on and we are getting a force to be reckoned with of a new generation of scientists saying, I don't want to be you know, keeping a ch chimpanzee or a monkey mm -hmm. or a rat in a small cage. Mm -hmm. I want to be doing something cutting edge with science. Yeah. Well, it's not difficult for me to wrap my head around how horrible it is that an animal would be used to test cosmetics or, or, or you know, antidepressants and things like that. Is there, I'm sure you get crazy pushback here. Like, is there, an, is there any argument where cutting edge science and research concerning life-threatening diseases requires some level of animal testing in order to identify and, and kind of find these cures. I think I'll give you a two-part answer to that, um, which may or may not be satisfactory, but the first part is it's just as people cling to wanting to continue to eat meat and dairy, 
people somehow have this uncomfortable feeling that they don't like change, and they really cling to the idea that surely somewhere there is some experiment or a little raft of experiments where you really do need to to eat animals or, or use animals in experiments. The same way people might say, but you know, if you don't, if you really worry about your protein, you might need. I think there's that this this clinging to the past, which doesn't really hold up, and the other part. We have places we can go now. We have things we can do. We need to push to take money. For example, for years, animals have been used in burn experiments. We have footage where they actually blowtorch pigs. And the, I mean, it's not nice to look at. Today, because somebody back then decided, let's put some money into seeing if there's another way to do that, we have cloned human skin. We can ship it. We can Federal Express it. We can put it on a, a plane. 80% of your body can be burned, and they can put cloned human skin on it. We didn't learn from those animal experiments. So the sooner we say, I demand that the government stop wasting, in one case alone, $36 million frightening monkeys, one single experiment, $36 million, and put that $36 million into something, innovative technology, innovative methodologies, mm -hmm. and we might get something sooner that will help human beings. I think those are the two things that we have to work on. Who is working on that right now? Is there is there activity around that? And also, are there any bills that are being sponsored right now to better regulate what's happening? We're working on it. We have 19 scientists in our Peter Science Consortium, and they're in all kinds of disciplines. And they actually are working with governments, both here and in Holland, in the UK, in Germany, and in Japan, in China even, to say, look, times have changed. Here's something you can do. It's quicker. It's cheaper. It's more expedient. And it doesn't cause animal suffering. Um, we just, in the last 12 months, got the Environmental Protection Agency to call us into a news conference after years of working with them, going to their symposia, holding symposia ourselves, doing podcasts with them on alternatives, to say, okay, we now have a roadmap. We are going to step away. We're going to stop using animals in toxicity tests. The Environmental mm. Protection Agency. So it is happening, but it requires constant vigilance and a constant push. And really, it requires people to talk to their members of Congress and say it's time for a new Research Modernization Act, which we have actually crafted, and we'll soon be having a news conference on mm. Capitol Hill about. Mm. That's great. Hopefully, yeah. yes. I mean, everything has to change. Yeah. As you're telling all these stories, I'm thinking <clears throat> that you're a very interesting uh, combination of passion, you know, that that meets this kind of abolitionist perspective. That also requires a tremendous amount of patience and diplomacy, <laughs> right? Like, how do you reconcile those two things? Because in order for you to do what you do and to make incremental progress, you have to do this dance, right? Where I don't know if compromise is the right word, but you've got to work with people, right? And you've got to fan the flames of positive change while also remaining true to your, you know, your values that originated this whole thing to begin with. Sometimes I'm not a very patient person. Yeah. And um, as some members of our staff will tell you, I have lost my temper. Um, and actually in the case of the Bobby Barasini Orangutan Act, where he used to beat them with a rebar behind the scenes every night, when attorneys came to see us and said, well, we're thinking of putting him back on the stage, I argued with them for a long time, tried to reason with them. They weren't buying it. it. It was a money deal. And I threw the rebar across the table at them. And they decided, okay, then we won't be doing that. Um, but no, luckily on our staff, we have wonderful patient negotiators, uh, strategists, and so on. And we brainstorm mm -hmm. a lot. Um, but yes, you do have to have patience. I definitely take comfort in looking back. Otherwise, I just couldn't carry on to see how far we've come and to see other, take a leaf out of other movements where they had to make hard decisions every day is, should we attack on this or should we compromise on this? And we like to say, we've got our heads in, heads in the clouds, but our feet on the ground. Mm -hmm. So we want total abolition. 
We don't want any discrimination or disrespect for any living being. But we also, if you can do it A to B to C to D, we'll work with you because we want to get to Z. Yeah, you have to. Yeah, right? absolutely. Yeah. You can't leap in most cases. Sometimes, yes. Yeah. But you can't usually leap from A to Z. Some of the biggest wins have to be what's happened with uh, marine life parks and with the circuses and and even the zoos, I guess, to some to some extent. Yes, um, roadside zoos, we're busy closing. And I think we've got, I'll tell you the wrong figure probably, but I believe it's 84 individual isolated bears out of those places. We've closed a lot down. We've taken out dozens of tigers and rehomed them in wildlife parks that are wonderful. Um, I think the end of the roadside zoo is nigh. Um, zoos are changing. You've got the Detroit Zoo, for example, where the director has said, once these elephants pass on, we know we cannot deal with the needs of elephants. We, it's, it's Zoos cannot, so we're not uh, going to do that anymore. We're closing the elephant exhibit. So we do see change there. And we do see some cooperation between the better zoos, which are not acquiring anymore and are not doing research anymore on animals in the basement, helping us close down the roadside zoos. We did just, as you know, uh, get SeaWorld to stop riding, yeah. having their trainers ride on dolphins' right. nostrums How on their faces. How is that place even still in business? They're changing, and they need to change faster because those orcas and those dolphins need to go back where they belong in the oceans. Um, but they are. They, there are more rides. There are, they're doing concerts. They are diversifying now. They just need to get rid of that wretched name SeaWorld or make it animatronic, make it 3D holograms of orcas, not real orcas who are losing their teeth trying to chew on the underground, underwater bars. Yeah. One of the arguments mm -hmm. with zoos is that they do do all of this kind of you know, work in terms of studying to better understand these animals. Like, walk me through like the validity of any of the arguments that kind of prop up and support the kind of zoo infrastructure <laughs> you know, as we know it. Big zoo. Yeah. Well, some of the worst zoos, of course, engage in animal experiments, which are not good. Fertility experiments and all sorts of things, and that's not something they make public. So we do. Um, they also, some zoos have been caught uh, getting animals off the black market, endangered species and so on, and we expose that too. Other zoos, as I say, are changing, and they are actually helping get rid of the worst zoos. But I think they all see the writing is on the wall, and they see that today kids don't really want to go to the zoo. They've got everything they could mm -hmm. possibly wish to have on the internet it, they can interact with animals. They can go undersea and interact with animals with virtual reality without harming a hair on an animal's head or a fin or anything else. So, yet yeah, zoos started off, and I talk about this in Animal Kind, they started off as menageries where one of the saddest things I've ever read was out of Africa. Um, the author describes going down to the docks, I think it was Nairobi somewhere, and seeing giraffes years ago who had been able to stride across the Great Plains in these massive herds. And there are two of them on a boat in a wooden crate and saying their world has shrunk to nothing now and they're going to be taken across an ocean. They've never seen an ocean. How frightening. And they're going to end up, I think it was Hamburg, they end up in Germany in a zoo in a small pen. We still have zoos who cannot in any way provide for one giraffe. You know, they, and they swap animals around as if they're commodities. That whole mm. system of seeing animals has to change. We did just have two judges, one in Brazil, one in India, who actually ruled that in both cases, elephants were not commodities. They couldn't be taxed like property, that they were refugees from abuse. It's the most wonderful thing, and that's the way wow. I think law is going, will go, takes a long time, takes a lot of effort. Yeah, I've noticed that young people find zoos, you know, my daughter, like she doesn't like, she, I've taken her to a zoo and she's like, I don't ever wanna go back there. 
And that's not an experience that I remember having as a young person. I think it speaks to a new generation of people who, who are just, who are just um, more conscious of these things than we ever were in our younger in our well, younger you, years. You see the circus. I mean, when I was a kid, and that's going back, but even beyond then, um, more recently than then. The circus came to town. They would have the elephants go down from the circus wagons to the big top and actually help put the big top up, mm -hmm. courtesy of a bullhook, you know, that fireplace poker thing. Um, but kids would go out, line the streets, so excited to see exotic animals come to town right there in front of them. Those days are long gone. And of course, we closed down Ringling Brothers, Barnum and Bailey, right. what we would call the cruelest circus on earth, um, for awful cruelties behind the scenes. I don't think people even know. They burned a lion to death going through the Mojave Desert. They had three baby elephants in separate incidents killed during training. They should never have been away from their mothers. So people are learning about this stuff. They now know what a bullhook is, and they're saying no to circuses. I think the time of deciding that wild animals are props for us is not something young people think of. They, they, they think, oh, they're wonderful. Look how they live, how intelligent they are. Look at their lives in the wild. Their incredibleness, if you will. Yeah. yeah. And how do you think about the pet trade? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Badly. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, look, our shelters are overflowing. We've got dogs, cats, even bunnies um, with nowhere to go. They're going to be put down because no matter how hard you try, uh, there aren't enough good homes to go around. And so how can we ever support somebody somewhere having a puppy mill farm and shipping in puppies to be sold in glass cages in a, a, a shop? Or, you know, going to a breeder. We always say adopt, don't shop. Yeah. And even people who you ordinarily wouldn't associate with understanding this concept seem to get it now. But so many people are still buying. And no, pet shops are actually the reverse of what we should be doing. They're putting more animals on the market. We need to spay and neuter, number one thing, cut it off at the pass, ounce of prevention. And then secondly, always adopt, never shop. Don't go to a breeder, don't go to a pet shop. Close them down. Yeah, well, I think, I think education has gone a long way towards, towards moving that needle. It has, you know. but then again, there's such frustration when you see how many people have French bulldogs, pugs. There was just the Westminster Dog Show. You know, what is that but contrived breeds that humans have made with squashed faces, with dysplastic hips, with all these physical problems that will cost you a lot of money, if nothing else, and they're not you know, the wholest, heartiest animals. Well, want. just not to mention the entire strangeness of that whole affair, <laughs> you know, parading these dogs around for some yeah. kind of prize. It's, it's a, like it's little all girls' very, beauty it's very pageant. Strange. Very, yeah, very yeah, yeah. odd. Yeah. Um, one of the things that I see going on right now is a, there's a tremendous amount of energy that goes into greenwashing because people are more aware and they do want to feel like they're making the conscious ethical choice. And yet there is so much energy and money behind marketing products in a way that's dishonest and disingenuous to make people feel like they're making that right choice when they actually aren't. Absolutely. And now there's humane washing. I right. Mean, ethically we, treated animals, they're, they're ethically, all these sort of terms that get phrased, that get thrown around that aren't, they're not really regulated or, or legally defined terms. They're just loosely, you know, constructed marketing phrase. Usually rubbish. They're rubbish. I would say it's so easy. If you really care, and so many people do care, is just don't buy anything that comes from an animal because either the animal gave up their life for it or they're kept in confinement for years and years or it was stolen from them and they needed it. Um, I go up to people in the grocery store, for example, because I see them, if they've got a package of eggs. Oh no. And you, oh yeah, always, <laughs> always. What do you say to these people? <laughs> well, you'll see this green grass on the eggs and it says uh -huh. free range, organic. And I say, excuse me, I noticed you're buying those. I'm sure that means that you care about getting away from cruelty to animals. And they'll say, yes, I, always. And I say, well, let me just tell you, if you go to the PETA website, 
you will see what a fraud this is. Because places like Nellie's Eggs, we've been inside their sheds. And Nellie's Eggs, we're suing them right now. There's a class action suit. How dare you tell consumers they're humanely produced? These hens have less than the size of this book to stand in. They're crammed together. They have no pecking order. And they say, oh, well, they can go outside. They can if they can fight their way to that little hole that you've cut at several spaces in this, you know, hugely crowded shed. And p chickens are afraid. And if they do go out because it's open and it's closed at night, it's closed in winter, it's closed if it's raining, they will find probably a space not that much bigger than this desk that's just a bit of mud. Mm -hmm. So... No, stop lying to consumers. Just don't buy anything that and comes then, from and, an animal. And what's, it's not the voluntary. what's the reaction that you get? <clears throat> oh, I don't tell people all that. I just say, go and look at the yeah. video, and this is basically <laughs> okay. what we said. And people are usually grateful. Uh -huh. um, and we actually have filmed consumers coming out of the grocery store and asked them, hey, you've got those organic, sustainable, free-range eggs. Uh, let me show you video. We show them a little bit of video, and without exception, everyone goes, Oh, my God, I had no idea. Well, I'll never buy those again. Well, I, really, I thought. Yeah. Consumer fraud, if you ask me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I, I think that that uh, there's a lot of opportunity also with respect to to um, to dairy and, and, with, and with respect to wool. Because those are things that I think the average kind of less than informed consumer just can feel like, well, I'm not killing the animal. Like I'm, I'm using their product, but you know, they're, they're treated fine and they're on a farm somewhere. Bless your heart for yeah. saying that. The two things are, well, it's just a haircut, isn't it, for sheep? And say, if you saw the video footage, you would know. And I've been to Australia where most of the wool in this country comes from. And I've seen them cut to shreds. And they didn't think anything of it. I was there because they also take the lambs and cut the flesh off the backs of the lambs in a thing that's called mulesing that they've been doing since 1920. I was there to argue them on that. They didn't think anything of the shearing sheds. And so they just walked me through. And the shearing sheds, the sheep are just trembling from head to foot. They've been cut to pieces. Sometimes they've lost a teat or a part of the side of their ear or something because the men are working so quickly. They're paid the most they can do. So nobody takes any care. But the other thing is dairy is that people will say, and I said it too, is they don't kill the cow for dairy. But of course, where is this retirement home for all these dairy cows? There isn't one. Yes, they do. They kick her and shove her down the same ramp that the so-called beef cow goes down. But when she's in the worst possible shape, she's dried up or she's got mastitis. And along the way, it's far crueler than beef because they've taken her beloved baby away mm -hmm. every time for veal or whatever they've done. So, mm -hmm. no. Where are the current biggest battlefields? Like, what, what is, where is PETA investing its energy at the moment? Unfortunately, we don't have the luxury of homing in on one, honing in on one place. We have um, food, clothing, experimentation, pest control is another one. Why do we use gut-wrenching poisons, sticky glue traps, and so on, if we want to get rid of animals who are here first, but we now find inconvenient? Um, there is animals in entertainment, which, as you say, is just, you know, it's going away. We just have to push it over the cliff. Um, but experimentation is a number one push because that really needs an awakening in the same way that we've woken up to the enormous waste and suffering that goes into meat and dairy production. Yeah, I think, you know, just from my own experience, like that's the area I know the least amount, uh, least about, and I feel like that's an area where, you know, some education could really be beneficial to people. 
We've mostly knocked out cosmetics testing on animals. When Peter started, I think there was one company that you could import something from France. It was called Nature de France. You could get a soap and so on. Then there were five companies. One was in Berkeley. You had to take your own bottle and mm-hmm, get things right. filled up. And now we've got over- We're going back to that, by the way. Now there's stores <laughs> yes. that, that are like, their whole marketing thing is that you bring your own bottle to but fill But that's it. for a good, yeah. another right. good reason. But now you can just go in the store. We just got Suave. And um, herbal essences, the two of the last big holdouts, they no longer test on animals. And we've just got China to adopt its very first non-animal test. China was a big holdout. Mm. So cosmetics, are, now it's <coughs> research for research's sake, basic, just inquis- inquisitiveness, curiosity-driven research. And it's old-fashioned show-and-tell research. And it's medical, so-called medical research, a lot of psychology mental health issues. I mean, people can't get into mental health clinics. They can't get into drug treatment programs. And yet we are giving drugs to animals for decades all over the country. We are giving them mental illness. We are causing them enormous suffering and there is no applicability at all. Is there any country that has its ethical barometer perfectly calibrated to your worldview? Like, is there any, <laughs> like, is there a model out there where there's a nation that has a regulatory landscape and a legal system that that is protecting animals far better than we are? I'm not saying perfect, but is there, a, you know, like, is there a model that we can look to and at least work our way towards? I think different countries uh, do much better than we do in different areas. For example, Holland is definitely moving away from the use of animals in experimentation faster than we are. Um, You have countries like Switzerland where it's, I don't believe it's uh, legal anymore to keep a goldfish in a bowl Mm. because they have to have so much surface area. And they're not props, they're not decorations. Uh, You have countries in Europe where you can actually, uh, you're required to walk your dog three times a day and not just pretend that, you know, you're just going out to do your business and come home. You have to take them for a proper walk because that's their, they have a life too. It's against the law not to walk your dog. Uh, Correct. I love that. A certain number of times for a certain number of minutes. Um, We do have anti-slaughter laws against um, some animals in India, but that's mostly for religious reasons. Um, it really depends where you are. Yeah. Different countries, different things. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And if somebody's listening to this, I mean, if you go, with respect to the food, like, you know, I think people are kind of up to speed. You go to most markets now, they have vegan options, everything's labeled, and it's it's easier than ever to kind of make those decisions. But a little bit harder with cosmetics and consumer products. I mean, leather we can stay away from, but you know, there's a lot of glues that are used in in clothing, and and, and it's difficult even for a well-intentioned, somewhat uh, educated consumer to even know what they're buying, right? Where are the resources where people can go to learn a little bit more about this? Yeah, stuff? and I'm not really worried. I mean, this may sound odd, but I'm not really worried about. Uh, the purism, if you will, Uh of looking at every single thing, because we've got a long way to go. And we need to move the market with the big things. At the moment, leather, wool, those kinds of things, dairy, let's move them out. Uh, We do have huge resources, Animal Kind, the book, I've got resources in it, peter.org, resources. We have uh, lists of cruelty-free companies and lists of companies that still test on animals. We have health charities. For example, you can give money because you care about um, certain, let's take birth defects, Easter seals. They still use animals in experiments. Get away from it. You can give your money to um, another charity instead. So you can, we have those health charity lists. We have the cosmetics lists. We have the clothing lists, food lists, uh, you name it. Yeah. When you began this, the entry point, like the on-ramp was simply (laughs) an ethical argument about the treatment of animals. But now we have people who are coming into this because of their concerns about health. I mean, that was my introduction to this whole thing. And and now the environment, I think, has become a really huge uh, point of interest for people that's bringing more and more people into this. So the spectrum of, of you know, everything that you're doing has now broadened tremendously from, from when you began. 
It's true. We still have a long way to go, of course, and I am fond of telling people you can fly from Los Angeles to London and back to Los Angeles, and you still haven't uh, made the carbon footprint that you would have if you had two boxes of chicken nuggets. And people are amazed. They think, oh, it's flying, you know. So we still have a lot of education to do. A lot of people say, oh, it's so expensive to be vegan. It actually isn't at all. I mean, you look at cultures like Mexico and so on, beans, rice, salsa, pasta. Yeah, fabulous food for you, greens, you know, whatever. Um, So there's still a lot of education, but I think the generations growing up have their eyes open wider. I think they're more open to the compassion aspect of it, and they're going to teach the adults. They always do, don't they? They do. It is interesting what you said about purity, the purity argument. Um, there is a there is a strain of puritanism that that kind of you know underscores a large cross section of the vegan community, um, and I think that's important. Somebody has to like hold that line and let us know where it is. Um, but it also works across purposes, I think, with bringing people in. And I remember, like Lisa sitting over here, like I met Lisa years ago. She came here with a film crew to do an interview with me. And this was pretty early on in my, you know, evolution as a <laughs> vegan, you know, plant-based person. And at the time, I think we had like a cowhide rug that we just had forever and maybe a leather cow. And I was like, we got to get rid of this stuff before Lisa <laughs> comes over here cuz I don't want to get shamed and like how does this work and like I didn't know the landscape or the rule book about what's okay and what's not and I had a fear of that strain of puritanism you know you know being directed in my direction even though like I had kind of jumped the fence and was learning as I was going and I've certainly progressed and evolved since that moment um, but I think that's something that um that I think is common among people. And I know a lot, there's a, listen, there's a lot of vegan people that listen to this podcast, but there's a lot of people that, that aren't. And I think the just the sheer idea of Ingrid Newkirk coming on the podcast and sharing their, her message, it's like, oh man, like I don't, you know, I don't wanna be, you know, I don't wanna be judged for not being, you know, on this side of the fence or as far along in my evolution here, so. Well, I was the ultimate slow learner. I had my first fur coat at 19, I fished. Um, And it's funny because back then I would go along the pier and say to people who are fishing, um, you need to cut the spine because that'll stop them from feeling pain. Uh, You know, you need to stop fishing. (laughs) Um, I don't believe that it's about personal purity. Um, It's like some people will take yoga, it's just for health. There's a spiritual aspect to it. There's an ethical aspect to why we don't hurt animals. There's a moral aspect. There's a decency aspect. So it's good to point out to people that actually um, that came from suffering or there's an alternative to that other thing or you can be compassionate and you're being unwittingly cruel. But to do it in a nice way, I'm always trying first to negotiate because I remember I was defensive when someone said something to me, even about spaying my cat back then. I didn't know why you should spay your cat. And I'm so glad someone told me about factory farms, told me about fur. I had experiences that opened my eyes. So I do think we have the obligation to educate, but not be condemnatory because we're all learning. And then if people really don't budge, then I think you should be sharper with them and say, come on, you can do that. Here, I'll feed you. Mm. Here, I'll show you this. Let me take you out and show you this, Um, especially if they're family or friends. All right, so where do you see PETA in the future and this movement? Like if it, if it was up to you, what is this, what does this utopian world look like? <laughs> is this you know, paint sort of, the picture uh, and we'll like land this plane. I, I'm not very good at crystal balling things and I, I live day to day because we've got so much going on and so many things that we have to You're not do. retiring anytime soon. No. <laughs> I didn't uh, think so. The, the touch wood, nothing happens <laughs> that will make me. I won't be run yeah. over by a factory farmer. Um, but no, I mean, this is my life and this is what I want to do. And I don't want to be on my deathbed thinking, oh, I should have said something or I should have done something. I could do better. I wish I was smarter, but I, I want to do as much as I can. And I think Peter has that mindset at 
all our founding members have it, all our, our people have it, is that we want to get the job done and we know it's going to be a long job. So we'll never have world peace, we'll ha never have the end of child abuse, you know, but people work to get as much of it out of the way as possible and that's that's us. Yeah. We need everybody there, with us. There really is a very thin line between your life and your vocation. Like these are this this is who you are. Yeah. Through and through. Absolutely. This right? is what you makes can't you think separate what you do from who you are as <laughs> I a human feel being. so lucky. And that Rich. is a very lucky thing, right? To be able to ply your passion and to live this purposeful life that has meaning and and in so doing really change the world. And you have. It's it's remarkable the legacy of your career. And I commend you for that. Thank you. It's only because people have come on board. It's only because we've said your power of the purse counts, your activism counts. I try to do five things every day, what I would call outside my job. And that is- What are those? Putting uh, vegan starter kits in the back of the airplane pod. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I put them inside the magazines on all the seats before uh -huh. anybody comes in if I can. You are like you know? a secret agent. <laughs> Uh, talking to the people at the desk, removing the SeaWorld uh, pamphlets from the hotel where I'm staying because nobody needs to be enticed to go there until they change their stripes. Um, talking to people is just suggesting something, speaking to the person at the checkout, um, mentioning vegan foods or clothing, uh, complimenting something on something and saying, oh, that looks as if that's whatever. It's just working. Yeah. Well... Thank you for the service that you do. Oh, thank you for the Rich animals and and for humanity. Um, you, you are a gift, and uh, I'm in awe of your commitment to service. It's really a beautiful thing, and the world is a better place for having you in it. So, thank you. You are very kind. Thank you. Yeah, the book is Animal Kind. You can find it everywhere. Support your favorite independent bookseller, and if you can't do that, you can find it on. Amazon, you worked with Gene Stone on this book, who I know well. He's a wonderful man. Great guy. You did a great job with the book. I really enjoyed it. So thank you. And I wish you health so that you can continue to do the work that you do. I wish that to you too and everyone listening. Thank you. All right, cool. You. So if people want to learn more about you and the work that PETA is doing, PETA.org, and you're easy to find on the internet. Yes, and yeah. please let us help you. If yeah. you want to transition in any way, we are there for you. Cool. Thank you. Peace. Thank you. Plants.